Hi, this is Charles Miklevist in Product Management for Storage Networking at Brocade Communications. And I'm here today with Andy Dooley from our engineering organization. And uh, we're going to talk about extension trunking. Extension trunking is one of the key capabilities that we have in our extension platforms like the 7840, also found in our 7800 extension switch, as well as the FX8 blade for our 8510 and DCX directors. In the session today, we're going to talk about uh, what the feature is in a nutshell, why it's important, um, how to take advantage of the feature, and any design considerations that you have to take into account. So, uh, Andy, in a nutshell, what is extension trunking? Well, Trules, uh, extension trunking gives us the ability to take multiple disparate WAN paths and, and kind of uh, aggregate them together and form one logical connection between a pair of the extension switches. Now, we have trunking in the regular storage network, fiber channel trunking. Um, how is extension trunking different from uh, regular fiber channel trunking? Right, so, so what we have today, uh, it, it allows us, or, or the, the fabric side, uh, it, it runs short distance. It's designed to go within a data center. It's not designed to go over distance. Uh, it, it also does a hash-based uh, load balancing, meaning it, it does it on a connection base. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not quite as efficient um, as far as the distribution goes. What, what we do is we design ours to go over long distances, uh, you know, thousands of miles, and uh, we also do a frame-based uh, load balancing. So the, the distribution of load is actually very even uh, between the links. Got it. Now. Um, when customers deploy this, I know they often want to protect against different failure scenarios. And so the question of can I provision circuits from different telcos comes up. Um, can I can I aggregate together dissimilar WAN connections using extension trunking? Yeah, you, you can. And, and really, the way it's designed, there's there's not a lot the user needs to be concerned about um, as long as the the links are under the max uh, supported latency of the product line. Uh, the only recommendation we have is that the uh, the fastest link be no more than four times faster than the slowest link. Mm, got it. But but four to one, that's actually quite a bit. So so that means you could aggregate bandwidth from uh, WAN connections that are actually quite dissimilar. That's correct. Fine. All right. Now, take me through uh, what happens. So, you've established this uh, this uh, extension trunk, uh, you know, trunk connection over distance. Um, tell me what happens in a in a failure scenario. Um, when disruptions are common. So, what happens when you lose a WAN circuit? Right. So, so what we do is is we do send out uh, uh, keep alive or probe frames uh, across all the links, and, and what they're really probing for there is they're probing to make sure that the data frames can get from one side of the network to the other in, in a user specified amount of time. And what happens is, is either the link becomes too congested or the link goes away completely, a total outage. Uh, we'll detect that via the, the keep alive mechanism. And in that amount of time, you know, we'll see we can't get the data through. We'll bring that connection down and take it out of service of the trunk and then we'll move all the data over to the remaining good links. Um, and then you know the data will be able to make it from site A to site B. So we actually take the the frames of the packets that were underway on on the circuit that went down, and we'll run that over one of the other connections that are still up and running. Correct. Got it. How about when we when the connection is uh, reestablished, when the circuit comes back up and online again? Yeah, so uh, once it goes down, the first thing we start doing after we move the data over is we try to bring that connection back up into service. So we, we start attempting. And that we'll, we'll continue to do that actually for infinity or you know until the connection comes back up into service. Mm -hmm. Once it does come back up into service, we will actually put it back in uh, as an active member of the trunk again, and uh, new data will be allowed to flow over it. And at that point, the I.O. is rebalanced across all circuits, so you can make use of the additional bandwidth that uh, came back up on the Correct. Line. And um, how quickly does this happen? Like, how fast do we detect that there's a problem and, um, and in a disconnection event? And likewise, on a, on a reconnect, how quickly do we detect and, and rebalance the, yeah. the I.O.? Yeah, so for the disconnect event, it's actually very flexible. Uh, it's user configurable. Uh, the keep alive timeout value can be between 500 milliseconds and you know all the way up to multiple seconds. So if you have an application that's really time sensitive or, or latency sensitive, you can use a very small keep alive value. If you have a, an application that's more tolerant, you can use a larger value. Um, so that'll dictate the amount of time it takes us to figure out that a link is no longer usable or has gone down. Um, but then once we've detected it, 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 it's almost instantaneous. It's the very next thing we do. It's an immediate failover. As far as the bring back, once we've detected the, the links back into service, 
it's immediate. And we will continue to try to bring the link up, I mean, for infinity. So either the link comes up or we just keep trying. Right. And the uh, and the and um, there's no user um, input that's required from this point. When, when, uh, when the disconnect happens or when the reconnect happens, do I have to do any kind of reconfiguration or is that all completely automatic? Yeah, it's all uh, automatic. It's all built into the algorithm and it, it just takes care of itself. Got it. And generally speaking, you're saying between 500 milliseconds and half a second to maybe a couple of seconds. Um, so that's a short timeline. So relative to the replication application, uh, is this noticeable? Uh, while we're moving the data over, uh, there can be some flow control or back pressure in the device because, I mean, we got to scramble to get that data, you know, back to the other side. Um, but otherwise, you know, as long as the keep alive timeout is set short enough, uh, there'll be no I.O. disruption and no I.O. errors to the application. So it's actually very seamless. Got it. So for the, from the perspective of the replication application, they just see continued flow going on through the connection is largely transparent to that application. And in fact, um, if, there, if there wasn't um, the, uh, this, this feature um, and the replication application saw that WAN connection, you would have a disruption event. And one of the challenges there is that at the very high I.O. Ra rates that uh, this platform can handle, um, at those I.O. rates, you actually have a fairly short window to actually recover um, while this is going on. Um, you do run the risk without this where you could run through a buffer and force an array into full resync mode, which is very problematic from, a, from the perspective of maintaining a recovery point and recovery time objective. So this really gets us around that, uh, that whole uh, risk element. Now let me ask you this. Some replication applications are sensitive to um, in-order packet delivery, and that's one of the considerations. So with uh, the I.O. kind of feeling over back and forth between different WAN connections, how on earth do you keep track of, uh, of, of kind of in-order packet delivery? How do you ensure that that happens? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, so what we do is the trunking mechanism itself, it, it acts like a, a light transport layer, uh, meaning it sequences all, all the frames that go out, and it ensures when it receives them on the other side that it, it puts them back into sequence. Mm -hmm. So when a link goes down, we'll have sequences that are older, and we'll have newer sequences that'll go by it on the, on the good links. Uh, so when the failover occurs, we'll actually move the old data over, and then at the other end, we'll, we'll wait until we get the old data. We'll put it back into order it was sent originally, and then it'll go up in order. Got it. And I guess that means um, at the point where a disconnection event occurs, I guess there's some level of scrambling to make sure that those packets actually come through um, in order. That's correct. Right. Got it. All right. Now... One of the other things uh, that we see customers do is they often have many, many arrays, not just one, but they have lots of arrays and perhaps of different types that are all, all running replication traffic into the extension switch. Now, when you do that, to what extent do you have control over kind of prioritization of the traffic or what should happen in failover scenarios? between traffic from different arrays going through that extension trunk. Right, uh, so we, we do have a quality of service or QoS on the trunk itself. We, we do provide three QoS levels. Mm -hmm. um, the user can decide if they want to map the traffic to any one or all three of those QoS levels at one time. Got it. And then the user is allowed the uh, flexibility to configure those levels to give it a percentage of the overall bandwidth that would kind of be carved out for that application. Got it. So if I have, um, let's say, an array that is particularly important and I want to make sure that there's a given amount of bandwidth available to that array in any circumstance, I can actually allocate that um, um, the way I set, set up the trunk. Yeah, and the nice thing is too is if you are using multiple QoS's, uh, if one of them goes idle, uh, the remaining active users of other QoS's will actually be able to almost instantaneously use that bandwidth, right, that's not being used. So it's very efficient as far as moving the bandwidth between active members of the trunk and, and you know, users that might just be idling. And you can establish um, a, a single trunk over distance or you can establish multiple. Um, is there any, anything that we need to worry about in terms of um, kind of taking advantage of these features or is that just flexibility depending on the setup that the customer wants? Yeah, it, and that's, that's a lot to do with whatever the customer wants. I mean, typically we, we like to see one large tunnel taking advantage of the trunking feature itself between the sites. So QoS is typically the better way to go, um, but it is flexible and it works very well to either use multiple tunnels or, or the single tunnel with the QoSs. All right, got it. All right, Andy, thank you so much for explaining all of this uh, to us. That concludes the session on extension trunking. Uh, thank you for watching today, and I encourage you to stay tuned to the Brocade YouTube channel for additional technical videos describing how our features work.